Welcome to our live webcast, Managing Cystinuria During COVID-19. Thank you for joining us. We are joined today by Dr. Katie Steigelman and Lindsay Jackson. I would now like to turn the microphone over to, to, excuse me, to Dr. Katie Steigelman. Hi, everyone. Good evening, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here to speak to you today about Cisnuria and COVID-19. I think this is a, a nice topic and a nice time to do this. You know, we're a year in, some things have changed. Um, we're seeing some progression, a little bit different than maybe the last this time last year. Um, we also have the pleasure to have Lindsay join us today. And so she's gonna share that patient perspective and the patient perspective journey of dealing this, with this disease during COVID-19. So before we get into the presentation, I'd like Lindsay to just say a few words about her disease, her story, and tell us a little bit about herself. So Lindsay? Hi guys. Oh, hi guys, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay, perfect. Uh, my name's Lindsay, I live in San Diego. I am 28 years old and I was diagnosed with cystinuria just over five years ago. Um, I found out when I was 22 that, you know, I had kidney stones, went through some different episodes in order, took about eight months for me to find out that I was actually diagnosed with this scenario. Um, and from there I had a few years that were pretty rough with stone formations, um, different surgeries. But again, what we're going to talk about today is, is COVID-19. Um, before I can get started, I do have to give you this lovely disclaimer that this presentation is intended for educational purposes only and does not constitute medical advice, so seek guidance from your physician if you have any questions. But when we think about COVID-19, like I mentioned, you know, we've, we've been in this for, for almost a year now. I think I've, I've seen on a lot of my friends' social media accounts pictures of, this is the last trip I took before, before COVID happened, or this is the last time we went out to a restaurant. So it's it's that big anniversary of when everything started to shut down and things started to change and these things started to change. Kids were home from school. We didn't, we didn't see an end to that. When, when are the kids going to be able to go back in school? What is the new learning normal going to be? People are working from home. And if it's anything like my house, this is kind of what working from home looks like. There's, there's usually a kid in the background screaming at me for my attention while I'm trying to be on a conference call, while I'm trying to type an email. And usually there's another one climbing on my back somewhere as well. You know, social distancing is now a thing. You know, I, I joke with my husband. I'm, I'm like, I just want to hug somebody. And then he gives me a hard time because he says I, I can hug him and I can hug the kids. But it's just, it's so different now. You know, you, you are able to see your friends, whether, you know, they're in your pod or whatever you're doing for um, COVID-19. But, you know, it's recommended that we stay six feet apart when we go to the grocery store. And so you, you see a neighbor across the street and you wave. You know, one of the things that happened to me was, you know, I actually moved at the beginning of, of COVID-19. And so that was a shock. You move to a new neighborhood and you see your neighbors and you're like, hi, I really want to meet you and talk to you, but I don't really know what we're supposed to do. And I don't know you and I don't know your situation. So I'm just going to stay over here on, on this side of the street. And having little kids makes it much more difficult because they want to go and find all the, the kids in the neighborhood. And when you take all of those things and you take what's happened over this last year and you roll it into your life, you know, you have so many things to do. You're trying to figure everything out. What's this new normal? Can I go out to a restaurant? How do I get to my doctor's appointment? How do I get my kids to school? When's the right time for my kids go, to go back to school? So they, should they do hybrid? Should they do e-learning? Should I put them back in school? You know, kids typically don't get the disease. You know, when are they going to be able to see grandma and grandpa? All those things kind of are in your head. And you, as an individual with a rare disease, you know, you always have this, this part that's the rare disease that's floating around here. Just because we're in a pandemic doesn't, doesn't mean your disease goes away. It just means you have to adapt and you have to change the way you're thinking about your disease. You know, one of the things is, though, you've been dealing with a rare disease, whether you have the disease or you're a caregiver. You've been dealing this, with this disease for, for a number of years. You understand how much of an impact this has on your everyday life. 
you understand that it causes a significant time burden as well as a care burden. You know, you're going, you're going back and forth to doctor's appointments. You're having surgeries. Um, you have to drink your water. You have to take your medication. You have to take, take time out of the day to do those things. You have to do 24-hour urine collections. If you're a caregiver, you, you have to monitor um, the people that you're caring for, make sure they're taking their medication, making sure they're following their regimen properly. So these things take time. You already have an impact on your water life balance. You know, you have to figure out how to drink water. You have to figure out how to be able to use the bathroom multiple times a day. You know, there's an economic burden there too. You know, the cost of potentially changing your diet, seeing your physician, traveling back and forth to doctor's appointments. And as we know, specifically for rare diseases, but even more specifically for the cystinuric community, there is a mental health impact on patients and caregivers when you talk about this disease. So if we go back to my image, you know, I, I pointed out initially that, you know, your rare disease was just one of these small little blurbs in the background, but really everything is compounded by COVID-19 and everything has changed because of COVID-19. But you still have a disease. You're still monitoring your disease. You're still trying to stay stone free. You're still trying to have your lifestyle therapeutic changes. You're still trying to take your medication. You're still trying to see your doctor or you're still trying to care for these individuals that are doing that in the midst of all of this. So it's very complex and very time consuming and very worrisome for a lot of people. So hopefully as we walk through this presentation, Lindsay and I are able to answer a lot of your questions around the disease, um, around COVID-19 and kind of what it means for you. So we know that this is a difficult to treat disease. We know it's a chronic disease, but what does that have to have to do with COVID-19? So you guys can tell me, you can tell me that you typically maybe see one new stone formation per year. That's what the literature says. You guys have multiple procedures. Um, by middle age, typically one surgical procedure every three years. But the key on this slide is that up to 70% of patients may develop long-term kidney disease. So what does that really mean for you? And what specifically does it mean in the context of COVID-19? Well, when we say long-term kidney disease on this slide, we really mean CKD or chronic kidney disease. So about 70% of patients that have cysteine stones will have long-term kidney disease, or CKD. CKD is classified into five stages. So you have stage one, which is typically what the vast majority of patients are gonna fall into. And this is when your kidneys are really functioning at about 90%. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about chronic kidney disease. It's how well is your, are your kidneys functioning? I'm sure you've talked with your physicians about EGFRs, or glomular filtration rate. So you've talked to them a little bit about that and you understand that. So that's what we're talking about here. And how does that transition into COVID-19? Well, I'm sure you've heard, if you've read anything about COVID-19, that having CKD or chronic kidney disease at any stage increases your risk for severe illness from COVID-19. So let's take a step back here. Having CKD, does not mean you're at higher risk for getting COVID-19. Your risk is just, just the same as someone without CKD for getting COVID-19. But if you do get COVID-19, there is a likelihood that it may go into a more severe illness. And severe illness with COVID-19 is defined as hospitalization, admission to the ICU, intubation, or ventilation, or potentially death. So we don't have the numbers around this, um, but some of the literature just does suggest um, that about 30% of patients that do have COVID-19 will come out with some sort of kidney damage afterwards. So when you have a disease where you already have chronic kidney disease, having another disease compounding that is going to be is going to be problematic. So that's why it's important to follow the CDC guidelines and the recommendations when it comes to COVID-19. So again, you guys have heard this. This has you know, been drilled into our heads over the last year. You know, wear a mask to protect yourself. Stay at least six feet apart. 
you know, I like that cow analogy I, I put on, on the other slide. Somebody was telling me that they work at an event area. So they work at a stadium close to where I live and, and they're employed by the stadium and they have to walk around with a pool noodle and hold the pool noodle out. And that's, you know, they're six feet away to make sure people are staying six feet away. Avoid crowds. And I know, I know that's difficult. You know, we want to get back to norm. Everybody's getting a little stir crazy. The four walls around me are, are slowly starting to come in. But it's important for you to understand that this disease could really be detrimental to your health based on the fact that you already do have some damage to your kidneys. And this damage could be caused by the stones. This damage could be caused by the recurrent surgeries. And I'm not saying this to scare you. Again, the vast majority of patients, again, it's 70% of patients that have the disease. So you could, you could be in that 30% and not, not have CKD. And then the vast majority of the patients that have the CKD are in very early stages. So your kidney is still very well functioning. So what does CDC say specifically for patients that with CKD? So what's the category you would fall into? So continue to do everything that your physician recommends for you. So continue to take those medications. Continue on your diet. Make sure you have at least a 30-day supply of your medication. Stay in contact with your healthcare team. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit about how is the best way to stay in contact with your healthcare team right now. Talk to them about your medications, about your foods, about any problems that you might be having. And remember to still follow your diet. They, they suggest making sure you have self, self, excuse me, self, shelf stable food. That was a little bit of a tongue twister to help you follow your kidney diet. But we know that sometimes those, those foods that are shelf stable aren't exactly the best, the best food for your kidney diet due to the sodium. So what, what we're going to talk about now is, you know, really, actually, before I do that, I'm going to jump over to Lindsay and I want to ask Lindsay a question. So, Lindsay, have you thought about this at all when you see the news and you hear about COVID-19 and you, you hear about patients, you know, going into the hospital and that, you know, this is majority, you hear about patients going on ventilators and it'd be more of a respiratory disease, but there is some information out there in the news that talks about how it does, does affect your kidneys and how the virus you know, why we don't fully understand what's going on, the virus does target your kidney cells as well. Um, it could be because you have lack of oxygen and that's what's damaging those cells. It could be because of the immune response in your kidneys. Uh, we're not really sure the mechanism of action, um, but a lot of patients also, in addition to their respiratory issues, they are coming out um, with, with kidney disease and with problems for your kidneys. So is this something that you think about, Lindsay, in your everyday life? Is this something that you've noticed in the news? Um, do you try and stay away from the news? I feel like I've stopped listening to the news between politics and COVID in the last year. I just, I just have stopped. So I just want to get your, your thoughts on that and your thoughts again on just how you think about your disease and, and COVID-19. Yeah, so I think in the beginning, I definitely, you know, watched the news. I was reading all the articles, um, you know, and kind of the ways that COVID was affecting people's bodies, um, their lungs, and, you know, compromised individuals. And I think, you know, in the beginning, I was a little bit more freaked out and felt like I needed to be a little bit more cautious about what I was doing. Um, and, you know, the first kind of course of action I did was I actually reached out to my kidney specialist and asked him, you know, having cystinuria, does that put me in the immunocompromised um, group for COVID, you know, is there a likelihood that I could get it given like the surgeries that I've had? Um, and, you know, from what he had told me, he pretty much reassured me that because I am, you know, younger and healthier, um, I shouldn't specifically be a target of it or somebody that was more susceptible, but that there was still obviously always a chance given, you know, the previous surgeries undergoing uh, anesthesia and things like that, that, you know, it's really kind of unknown, which was something that was a little bit hard for me because, you know, we always want answers as human beings. Um, and we don't like to go into the unknown, especially with a disease and a pandemic. So I think that that was a little bit difficult, but I think more and more as like time went on, I got a little bit more comfortable with, you know, being out and about doing things with people, um, but was still kind of cautious about, you know, the people I was around and not exposing myself to something. 
No, yeah, and and just for the audience, so the the physician you go see, um, he's a urologist, correct? Uh, yeah, he is, and he specializes in uh, the scenario. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that I don't know if anybody in the audience has experienced, but if you're followed by a nephrologist, you might actually be having a little bit of difficulty getting in. Later in the presentation, we'll talk to Lindsay about her experience with, with telemedicine and, and getting into office visits. But with a, if you're being followed by a nephrologist, you might have a little bit of a difficulty getting in to see your physician because they are being called upon so much uh, to help with the COVID-19 patients in the hospital. Because like I said, you know, at least 30% of those patients that are hospitalized are, are coming out with kidney damage. Some of them even have to go on dialysis or, or on to transplant. So this, this disease, again, you know, you don't, this, as Lindsay pointed out, you're a group of patients, you're not necessarily immunocompromised, so you're not more susceptible to the disease. But if you do get it, um, we can, we, it's thought that your kidneys will become damaged more easily because they already have some extent of damage. So how can we adapt? You know, we've, we've been adapting this whole year for the disease. You know, we've changed our lifestyle. We've changed how we see doctors. We've changed how we've interacted um, through work with friends school, a number of different things that we've adapted through. And one of the biggest things that you guys have come, I'm sure you guys have come across, is access. So in the beginning, I think, you know, there was very little access into hospitals. You know, they weren't doing elective procedures. A lot of procedures were being put on the side. We didn't want to bring patients in if they didn't need to come in. So historically, telemedicine has been a cost-effective alternative to traditional face-to-face -face medicine. Um, some states use this. For example, states that don't have certain types of specialists will use this. So like uh, Mississippi, they don't have a lot of geneticists. Um, so geneticists are physicians that look at genetic conditions. So if you, you know, some of you may have had genetic screening done on you to, you know, understand, you know, if your sibling has the disease or if you, you know, wanted to have your significant other tested in case you wanted to have children. So you may have some experience with the, with the genetics world, but states like Mississippi, they don't have hardly any geneticists there. So telemedicine is a very um, frequently used method there that they can then see geneticists from different states. So this isn't a new idea to the healthcare field, but because, and it's something that more physicians have started to use, more offices have started, started to use. But COVID-19 really pushed this into the forefront. So there's multiple different ways you can use telemedicine. So there's clinician to clinician. This is, you know, how they communicate. Uh, telemedicine is also defined as clinician to patient. So this would be something that you would more think of. So sitting down, you know, in front of a, a screen and talking to a physician, you know, you can't get in to see your PCP, but they have a telemedicine visit appointment open for the sinus infection that you have. Or your child has a weird rash and you want to see, do I need to change? They're on amoxicillin. Do I need to put them on something else? You can do telemedicine appointments for that. Um, care for chronic conditions is also really key for telemedicine. Another aspect of telemedicine that, I'm, that I'll just mention briefly is, is patient te technology. So that's more of like wearable monitors. Um, so my father has something for AFib. And so basically it records his heartbeat throughout the day. And he has a monitor that's next to his bed. He has an implanted device. And so every night it takes the data and it reports it over to his physician. So if something happens, his physician calls him and says, hey, you need to come in and see me. So there's enough, a couple of different options when we're talking about telemedicine, but we're really going to focus on this orange one here, this clinician to patient telemedicine aspect and how it can really work for you. So like I mentioned, when we talk about telemedicine, it's kind of been slow to be adapted. Um, people still want to go in. They still want to talk to their doctor. But COVID-19 has really pushed it to the forefront. So one of the things that legislation has actually changed is that there was a new 1135 waiver as part of the CARES Act. 
So one of the problems with telemedicine is how to pay for it. Does it have a typical copay like you would have in a doctor's office? Does it cost more because it is virtual? Does it cost less because it's virtual? Those sorts of things. So this 1135 waiver as part of the CARES Act is for Medicare can pay for the office hospital or other visits via telemedicine across, across the country or in the patient's place of residence. So these screenings include managerial visits, mental health visits, preventative care screenings. So this got pushed through legislation last year. So now if you're on Medicare, it, telemedicine visits do get paid for. If we're talking about Medicaid, that's regulated by federal and state governments. If we're talking about self-insurance plans, that's regulated by the federal government. And then fully insured health plans is federal and state requirements. So again, Medicare and self-insured is all regulated by federal. So your rights for telemedicine is that these would be covered. Um, in terms of Medicaid and fully insured health plans, those are also regulated by the state. But just like I mentioned with the 1135 uh, waiver, states also issued emergency policies in response to COVID-19 to make telemedicine more widely available. So again, also commercial insurance payers have increased the number of services that co they cover. So depending on your insurance, and you'll have to look more in, in depth at that, we're not gonna sit here and go through insurance plans, but some have temporary and other ha others have changed it permanently. And the insurance will pay for phone or video visits with your primary healthcare provider, different specialists, uh, behavioral health providers, occupational, physical therapists, speech therapists. Um, a lot, some of the insurance have temporarily waived cost sharing. Um, so that really means you can go out of network. Um, to get those virtual visits if need be. So I know that I've taken advantage of this in terms of, of physical therapy. I was doing some physical therapy before COVID started and then, you know, COVID hit and I just, I didn't feel comfortable going into the office. I didn't know where it was going. And so I was able to take advantage of telemedicine. So I have my laptop on the floor while I'm doing my exercises, watching, watching my physical therapist doing it there through the screen and it, and it worked out really nicely. So some obvious benefits of telemedicine are it's convenient. Um, you don't have to leave your house. You can sit in your PJs. Maybe, you know, traffic is really bad at 9 a.m., but now you just, you know, get up and you take that appointment over the computer versus having to get in your car um, and, and go through rush hour traffic. So that's to the next point, reduce travel time. But for you guys, you have a rare disease. So that doesn't always mean your physician is, is down the street. Um, patients are going from rural areas into major cities. They're traveling a number of hours. Um, so this can definitely reduce your travel time. When it comes to what you can talk about with your HCPs, you guys are you're doing 24-hour urine collections. You can review those 24-hour urine collections with your physicians over the computer. They're going to be able to show you those, those results and talk to you about those results via telemedicine, just like they would, they would be doing um, live and in person. They can talk with you about dose adjustments or change to your diet over telemedicine, just like they would uh, do in person. As we just went over in depth, you know, it's covered by the insurance. So it's not something that you have to worry about an extra out-of-pocket expense when we're talking about telemedicine. It limits your exposure to other people and potentially it can prevent delay in seeing, seeing your physicians because again, you know, potentially if you're seeing a nephrologist, you may have delays because they're working more in the hospital right now. Um, or, you know, your physicians may be, their offices may be closed and they may have limited staff due to the pandemic. So, Lindsay, I'd like to just chat with you about telemedicine. I know that you have some experience using telemedicine with Dr. Sir, and you've, you've done a couple of appointments. So, how did, how did those go for you, and how, was, how did you feel about talking to him in a telemedicine environment or a virtual environment versus face-to-face? -face? Yeah, um, I actually prefer telemedicine just because he's actually about 45 minutes away from me, so doing anything in person, especially just to get um, like results for urine, 24-hour uh, urines and things like that. It's a little bit easier for me to just do over the phone, um, which most of the time he actually will do. So I've already been introduced to that a little bit. Um, as far as, you know, when COVID happened, everything got switched to pretty much all virtual. 
Um, and for me personally, it hasn't been too bad of a transition. I think it's, you know, easier for people to get information faster um, if you don't have time to go in, which I hear a lot of the times, you know, people don't have time to make appointments or take time out of their work day to go in. Um, so I think that it's definitely benefited in the way that, you know, it doesn't take as much of your time. It's a little bit more convenient. And I think it keeps people more committed to, you know, getting with their physicians and completing those um, follow-ups that they have. So do you find that it's actually helped you, you know, keep your follow-ups? You, you mentioned that he's kind of far away and, and I know that you, you work and you have a life outside of, of the disease. So has it helped you maybe keep some of your appointments or make sure you stay on track with your regularly scheduled appointments? Say, you know, you see him every three months, every six months, make sure you're, you're keeping on track with those regular scheduled appointments. Yeah, I think it's definitely made it easier. Um, I think it made my scheduling easier because I can just, you know, take five or 10 minutes away from work rather than taking an hour and a half to drive back and forth and sit and wait for the appointment. Um, so for me, it's definitely been a lot more convenient. And yeah, it definitely keeps me more on track. Um, and it, I have more flexibility in my schedule to schedule the appointment kind of quickly or farther out and just be better about sticking to them and not canceling. No, that's great. Do you have any any cons to it? Tell us tell us the ugly. Any ugly to it? Or have you pretty much enjoyed it the whole time? Um, honestly, I enjoy it. <laughs> um, I'm not really the biggest fan of like going and parking and having to check in and sit and wait and then go sit in the room. Um, so this way, you know, it's kind of like when he's ready to jump on the call, he jumps in, we get going and then it's done. So it usually takes like five to 10 minutes. Um, so time wise, no, I, I think it's definitely a lot more efficient. No, I totally, I totally agree with you. You know, I, like I mentioned, I've done some, some telemedicine visits since, since this all started. And I think it's to your point, a lot, a lot easier to schedule, a lot easier to get on their schedule. And yeah, you still, there is still some wait time, you know, I've experienced, you know, you're sitting in that virtual waiting room for a little bit while they're finishing up with their last patient um, or the patient before you. But, you know, you're also you're sitting there on your computer. So if you're working from home, you can continue to do what you're doing or you can browse Amazon or other shopping avenues or look up recipes for what to make for dinner. Um, so I think it's, you know, a little bit easier to multitask in, in the telemedicine age as well. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. So let's talk about what you can do. So as a Cisneric, what can you do during this pandemic to really help yourself? You know, we mentioned the CDC guidelines. We mentioned, you know, staying six feet apart. We mentioned wearing a mask, you know, all those things that the CDC is telling us to do. But if we talk specifically about your disease, what, what can you do in this, this day and age? So let's go through let's go through your treatment options. So, you know, we know that we have the conservative lifestyle changes and we know that we have cysteine binding thiol drugs. Those are really the two steps in your treatment options. Conservative therapy and and then medication. So if you break that conservative therapy down, we have fluid intake, the diet modifications, and the alkalizing agents. So when we talk about conservative treatment, again, we let's start with fluid. So, you know. Are you still meeting your fluid goals? Are you still drinking enough water? Is your urine output where your physician wants to be? So this, I think, is going to be, you know, I think the pendulum is going to swing one way or the other, and I'm excited to hear what Lindsay has to say about this because, you know, if you're, if you're out working, now you're in an environment where you most likely have to wear a mask the majority of the time. You're in an office setting, um, you're in a hospitality industry where you're patient facing, you're forward facing with a customer, you have to wear a mask all the time. So maybe it's not as easy to sneak that water in. Or maybe your company has said, hey, we're not bringing anybody back to the office yet. We're going to do work from home or we're going to do part-time work from home. You're going to work from home three days. We're going to go in the office two days, you know, whatever it may be. Um, but I think, you know, potentially working from home can actually help you meet your fluid goals because you're sitting at a desk at home. You're sitting next to your refrigerator that is dispensing your water or next to your refrigerator that has your, your lemonade in it. So maybe it's easier when you get, when you're working from home because you have much easier access to those fluids. 
you have you don't have to wear the mask you have easier access to to the bathroom so we're going to talk to Lindsay about that in a second but just some helpful suggestions i mean i know you guys have been down this path for a long time but you know again if you're having difficulty making beating your water goals you know set set some goals that you can do outside of wearing your mask mask so introduce small amounts of fluid. So if you try and like sit there and be like, oh, I don't have to wear my mask right now. Let me chug this giant jug of water. You know, maybe that's not going to happen. But maybe if you start, you know, at a smaller amount and then gradually build that up, you'll get used to taking that extra water in at those times you can. When you take your medication, so whether that's your alkalinizing agent or your cysteine binding thiol drug, don't just take it with that sip of water or, or you know, the couple sips of water. Make sure you take a whole glass of water. And then each time you have a meal, make, make sure you have, you have a glass of water as well. But now I'm going to jump back to Lindsay. You know, those are some helpful suggestions. I know that you, again, you guys talk amongst each other. You get helpful suggestions from your healthcare providers. But I really want to get Lindsay's opinion because I know I know through the pandemic she she changed jobs. So she was she was on one side of the pendulum and now she's on the other side of the pendulum. So I really want to hear her advice for other cystinurics on how to really keep your fluid intake up during this pandemic and whether that's when you're in a forward facing customer position and you're wearing your mask a lot of the time, or how do you do it at home when you're sitting at your desk, which I find working from home, a lot of the times I'm actually busier because you're not having uh, the interruptions of, you know, somebody in the cubicle next door to you coming over and saying, hey, let's chat about this. And you can look up from your computer, look up from your typing and, and drink some water while you're chatting with them. So, Lindsay, Lindsay talk to us about your, your occupations and kind of how that's been with fluid consumption during the pandemic. Yeah, um, so I... Originally, like when I first got a diagnosis with Smeria um, for the past like five years, I've worked in food and beverage. So I've worked in restaurants um, and I always found it a little bit more difficult to keep my fluid intake up because I was always on my feet and serving tables. Um, I get really busy for a couple hours and just kind of forget to drink water. Um, so everything that happened with the pandemic, I actually went into a full-time role working from home remote um, 100% of the time. So I've definitely noticed that that change has allowed me to be a little bit more focused on my fluid intake. Like I always have water right next to me. Um, I notice that I pick up the water bottle a lot more often. Um, so it's a little bit more of a conscious effort for me personally. Um, I'm definitely better about taking my middle dose of Biola, which I wasn't doing as well when I was working in the restaurant, um, just because I'd be busy, you know, hours would go by and all of a sudden it's eight o'clock at night when I'm getting off. Um, so I definitely think that the pandemic for me personally has allowed me to be a little bit more focused on my water and food consumption. Do you have any tips from when you were back in the, the food and beverage industry about how you tried to meet your water goals when you were, you know, on your feet all day and, and not really realizing what time it is, like you said, till you got off work at eight o'clock and the whole day has passed. Was there something that you were doing to really keep your urine output up? Yeah, um, so we actually, it's kind of funny. A few of my coworkers and I, we used to do um, water chug challenges um, and they were coworkers that knew about like my kidney stones and cystinaria and everything. And so, you know, we'd notice we're really busy and we're like, hey, we need to stop for a water break. And we'd fill up a cup and we would all chug a glass of water. Um, so I noticed that that was definitely something that helped me. It's kind of a random thing, but um, I think it's just really being cautious or conscious of it and just really like pushing myself to remind myself like, hey, I haven't been drinking water. Um, I definitely notice my body when I do get dehydrated. You know, I feel a little bit more sluggish. Um, I feel more tired. Um, so I just really try to push myself to remind myself to drink water, make sure I'm taking my medication, whether it's setting an alarm um, putting it on my nightstand or on my desk now, um, I think that that's definitely helped me. So you do use an alarm or an app or something that like reminds you to to drink water periodically through the day, just in case. Um, yeah, I don't necessarily. I used to try and use alarms for the water drinking. Um, then I would realize I would just you know turn it off and then wasn't really using it for that specific reason. Um, and then I turned more to the alarm for the middle dose of Fiola because um, usually I would take it, you know, right when I woke up, it was on my nightstand and I would take it and right before I went to bed, I would take it. So those are pretty easy for me. Um, and then the alarm was something that I set for like that middle of the day because, you know, 
days fly by, all of a sudden you're like, oh, it's dinner time. I forgot. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very interesting because as, as we talk to more patients, you know, different things are really more beneficial for, for everybody. So once you find that little niche that makes it good for you, and like you said, whether it's having a, a, a friend circle at your job that's like knows about your disease, know what she needs to do and encourages you, or it's setting an alarm, or it's, you know, having a glass of water in every room. So when you, you know, go into the kitchen, you drink some water. Then when you go into the bedroom to get ready for bed, there's a cup of water on your nightstand, or there's one next to the sofa, you know, whatever it may be, you know, there's helpful tips and tricks for everyone to really get that, that fluid consumption up. Because again, you know, the more fluid we can take in, the more dilute that cysteine is going to get in your urine. And that's, that's really important to get you below that saturation limit. So let's go on. Let's talk about the next thing. So the next thing in conservative treatment is, is diet. So reducing sodium. The AUA guidelines recommend less than 2,300 milligrams of sodium a day and to reduce that animal protein consumption. So in this day and age, I think it's a little bit, a little bit more difficult, um, at least for me when I'm thinking about meals, because I'm, I am not used to staying home every night and, and cooking meals. I used to travel very frequently for work, and so I didn't have to think about meals. So now thinking about meals and planning meals has actually become a little cumbersome for me. So there, there seems to be more takeout in my, my life than I, I expected there to be. And when you think about takeout, you know, those those are easy to get meals. Those are meals prepared in restaurants. Typically, when you get meals that are to go, you're getting larger portion sizes. So some of the things that you, you really need to remember is, is to keep that sodium low and to keep your protein intake low. So what is what does that really mean? So I have a couple examples here on this slide. So we first we talk about sodium. So re reduce your sodium less than 2,300 milligrams per day. So what is that? You know, when you think about it, a cold cut sandwich from Subway, a six inch is 930 milligrams of sodium. One of my, um, one of my downfalls is soup. I like soup, even though I live in Florida and it's hot, I still like to have my soup. And it was, it was funny. I was on the phone with some of my, my colleagues and I was eating soup for lunch and I just happened, you know, it was one of those individual size plastic containers that you stick in the microwave and warm up. And I just happened to look at the side of it and I saw how much sodium was in the soup. And I was, I was shocked. I just didn't even think about it. You know, even working in this, this field for a number of years, I was shocked to see how much sodium, you know, was in that soup. And then, of course, the, you know, the container is like two serving sizes and I'm eating the whole thing. So then I'm doubling my sodium. So think of a cup of broccoli cheddar soup from Panera. That's 990 milligrams of sodium. Fries from McDonald's are 400 milligrams of sodium. So again, when we, when we talk about sodium, it's not necessarily, a lot of people think it's about that table salt that you sprinkle on. It's more about the processed foods. You know, when you think about this, this sub from Subway, you know, that meat is processed. That meat is able to be, to stay in that refrigerator case for an extended period, period of time. So that's where you're getting your sodium from. The soup, again, shelf life on soup is crazy. If you look at the expiration date, it, it's years out. And how do you think they, they do that? That's with sodium. Large fries, obviously, that's, that's more of the sprinkle, the sprinkle effect. Um, but, yeah, so when you're thinking about reducing your sodium intake, make sure you're trying as much to stick to, you know, fruits and vegetables and fresh fruits food. You know, when you get those things off the shelf or you get those frozen meals, anything that's able to sit around for a long time, whether it's on the shelf or in your freezer, it's probably not the best option to keep your sodium down. When we talk about reducing protein intake, you want to reduce that methionine. So protein, animal protein contains methionine and methionine is broken down into cysteine. So the more methionine you eat, the more animal protein you eat, uh, the more cysteine that you're going to have in your urine. So when you think about protein intake, you really want to reduce your methionine 
um, but don't reduce it too much. So here's a here's a couple of examples here. Um, so chicken breast, you know, 490 milligrams of methionine. Two eggs has 390 milligrams of methionine in it. And one cup of 1% milk has 190 milligrams of methionine in it. It's a little bit easier if you take a step back and you look at it that you want to reduce your protein intake to one gram of protein for every kilogram of body weight that you have. And when you think about body weight in this scenario, I want you to think about it, your ideal body weight. And again, we're going to have to do a little math here. So one gram of protein to a kilogram of your body weight. So when you think about that conversion, you know, of course, we're we're in America, so we have to have all that weird math. We can't just be on the, the metric system. We have the, the weird stuff. So one kilogram is about 2.2 pounds. So if you weigh 220 pounds, that's 100 kilograms. So reduce your protein intake to about 100 grams of protein. If you weigh 110 pounds, that's 50 kilograms. So reduce your protein intake to about 50. So how can you do this in this day and age? You know, some helpful suggestions. Plan ahead. Again, when you choose restaurants, make sure you choose foods that are best suited for your diet and try and see if the restaurant will make your food to order. Um, try, and involve, it, try and avoid them adding extra salt or having gravies or sauces. You know, those dishes or casseroles are usually high in sodium. Remove the skin from poultry and any crust from other fi fried foods. Also, as I mentioned before, you know, serving sizes you get at the restaurants are actually a lot larger than what you typically eat at home. And it's funny, I actually have a restaurant that it's a Thai restaurant that we like to go to. And we actually like, so you get more food in the restaurant than you would eat at home. But when we get takeout, we even get more food than they give you in the restaurant. So bringing home that takeout container, it's like four to five to six serving sizes. So just be cognizant um, when, you're, when you're doing these things. I'm not going to tell you not to eat out, not to do these things. You know, you can't. Everything in moderation is, is good. Um, so, Lindsay, how, how do you do some of your, your diet? How do you work around the sodium problem and the, the animal protein problem and what you eat? And has the pandemic changed your diet and what you're doing? Yeah, so personally, like the pandemic itself hasn't changed my diet. Um, I definitely realized, like, especially in the beginning of the pandemic, I was cooking at home a lot more. So I was a little bit more um, conscious of what I was eating and putting into my body. Um, I've always been somebody where I never was told necessarily by my specialist that I had to follow a strict diet. He just always told me, you know, the more fluid I can do, the better um, and, you know, the less salt. So in the beginning, I tried to really modify. I wasn't eating as much animal protein. I was really cutting out a lot of salt. Um, and I personally didn't see a whole lot of change in that. Um, so I did start, you know, I eat meat, but I also am very aware of like how much I'm eating. Like I won't eat it for all three meals of the day. Um, and I try to stay away from anything that's like frozen food because those usually tend to have a lot more salt. Um, and I do try to be pretty cautious of if I'm eating really salty food, making sure that I'm drinking extra fluids on top of it. No, and I think that's that's a great alternative. You know, like I said, everything in moderation and I don't, you know, I think sometimes if you take away too much, then you just, you know, binge on it later because you're you're in you're being denied of it. So I think, you know, if you can kind of counteract it you know, which one of the things that you can do is, is to really, like Lindsay said, you know, if you're going to eat something and you know you're going to have that container of McDonald's French fries, well, have an extra glass of water with it. Um, again, you can't, um, you can't limit yourself for everything, but there are ways around it. So alkalizing agents or, or medication, you're taking that alkalizing agent because we want to change that pH. We want to increase that pH to make cysteine more soluble. So like the CDC guidelines said, they said, you know, have extra medication on hand for at least 30, 30 days. 
But it's also important not to stockpile your medication. You want to continue to take your medication as your physician prescribed. You can't say, okay, this is a pandemic. I can't get out. I can't get out to my Walgreens to go to go get my prescription. I'm just going to, you know, only take two pills a day instead of three pills. And I know that that number is not probably likely what you're taking. Um, but you can't stockpile your medication. You need to take your medication as prescribed. And if you have an issue, you can speak to your doctor and see if they can prescribe you extra medication or you can get a three-month supply instead of just a, a one-month supply. But, you know, again, we want to make sure that you're monitoring your disease and, and you're, doing with, you're doing your treatment the way that your doctor recommends that you're doing it or else you're just going to end up back in that doctor's office or back having that procedure. And we, we want to avoid that. We want to don't, we don't want to put you in that space where you have to go into a hospital during this pandemic. Same thing as the alkalizing agents. Remember to take the, those medications um, the way that you need to take them. And it's also important to remember that the cysteine binding drugs have a quick onset and offset of action. So you want to maintain those, those medications and not stockpile them. Because if you start to miss doses, then the cysteine is going to start to build up in your urine again. And you could start forming stones. You can have that small nidus and really start, start forming stones just, just from not taking your medication a couple of times. Lindsay, have you had any worry during the pandemic about not being able to, to get your medication or having trouble working with your physician to get refills? Um, I haven't experienced any issues. Um, the Hub has been a really great resource for me. Um, they're always really on top of reaching out, making sure that I have enough. Um, I've always usually had like an extra half of a bottle um, just because of the way things overlap. So I don't run into any issues. Um, but yeah, I mean, the hub has been amazing with everything medication related. And you haven't had any worry about not, not being able to get your medication or anything like that? No, and even during the pandemic, like nothing ever really was set back on me receiving it. I've received it every month without any issues. Um, so yeah, I haven't, I haven't really had any issues or concerns with that. Right, right. No, that's, that's very good to hear. So now let's move on to, to the next part that you can work specifically on in this pandemic. So we, we just talked about treatment for your disease. So how to monitor your disease. That's also something where it's very important that you as the patient really participate in and follow your doctor's orders when you're, when you're monitoring your disease. So monitoring your disease, you guys know this, is 24-hour urine collections. And imaging, you know, I know 24-hour urines aren't glamorous, and I know nobody nobody wants to do them, um, but they really are the window into your disease. It's really the way that your physician can get that snapshot of what's going inside, going on inside your body, and how they can best help you help yourself to really manage this disease and prevent stone formation. So according to the AUA guidelines, these 24-hour urine tests should be performed every six months with, within six months of initiating treatment or any change to dietary or medical therapy and performed more often um, if you're seeing any problems. And if not, then you can potentially go out to annually with this. So what's the <laughs> – I'm going to joke, and you guys are all going to shake your head at me, and you're going to say – Dr. Seigelman, you don't do these 24-hour urine collections. It's not a silver lining. But, but what's the silver lining here? You do your 24-hour urine collections at home. You do them in your privacy of your own home. You don't go have to go into a lab and have your blood drawn. So that, that gets you out and exposes you to, to other people, crowds, those sorts of things. You do these 24-hour urine collections at home. So in the midst of the pandemic, it's very easy for you to still do what you need to do to monitor your disease. The kits are coming to your home. They're delivered to your home. You don't have to go out and buy anything. You don't have to, again, go to a laboratory to get, a, to get your blood drawn. This is happening at your house. So please continue to do your 24-hour urine collections because we want to make sure that your physician has all the knowledge that they need to help you monitor your disease. 
So, Lindsay, I know you can tell me the good and the bad and the ugly about 24-hour urine collections and if anything's changed during the pandemic. And if you agree with me that maybe that's the silver lining, that maybe it's a little bit easier to do, you know, when you're working from home now. So you don't have to plan it for for a weekend. Now, you can do it on a Wednesday and and not just have that kit sitting in in the corner of the room, you know, kind of waiting for you to get around to it. Yeah, um, I would love to say that I'm amazing at doing 24-hour urine. <laughs> They're probably the thing that I like the least. Um, and I was a little scarred from the one time that mine got messed up, and I had to redo it again. But uh, when I was working in restaurant, it was definitely a lot harder because, obviously, I'm just not going to carry around a jug of urine with me to a restaurant. Um, so I would always have to kind of, like, plan or have a day off. Um, and then you obviously have to send it in on certain days. Um I think that the pandemic has made it easier, but I still make excuses for why I should put it off. Like, oh, I need to go (laughs) eat dinner. I need to work out or I have to go to an appointment today. um, So I just kind of push it along. But I think it's definitely better now that I can just sit down and do it and get it done while I'm working. Um, And I don't really have to worry about taking the time off. So it is easier. I just still think I make excuses because I don't like doing them. (laughs) <laughs> but it is easier to do it now if in yeah, in this definitely. in this day and age and you know again we understand that not everybody's still working from home not everybody has the ability to work from home and and just because of the pandemic you're you may still be going into an office again you may be um have a job where you still have to go in you still have to see clients you still have to see patients whatever it may be we understand that Um, But if you are able to work from home, you know, it really is the silver lining that now you can do your 24-hour urine collection. And again, I'm going to stress this over and over again, that this is really the way that your physicians can understand what's going on. We'll talk about imaging here in a second. Um, But, you know, sometimes things don't come up on imaging. Sometimes you're having pain. Sometimes you're passing gravel and and you don't see those specific things on imaging. So to really better understand what's going on, you have to do these 24-hour urine collections. In terms of imaging, um, you should have periodic imaging studies to look at stone growth or new stone formation. So you will need to go into the office to do these. Um, and I'd like Lindsay to talk a little bit about her her experience going into the office and, and doing imaging studies during during COVID-19 and also, you know, her preference for, for doing some imaging over other imaging. Yeah, um, I will say I'm way better about my imaging than my 24-hour urine test. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, no, during the pandemic, I mean, the one thing that was actually really nice during the pandemic about imaging, um, I usually get – an ultrasound done every six months um, just to kind of monitor if I, you know, kind of feel different. I'm at a point now where like I can feel even if I am passing gravel or think I might be, my body will feel a little bit different. Um, And so I usually keep up on the six months for ultrasounds just to make sure I'm not forming anything new. And if I am to kind of monitor any small stones that are in there. Um, aside from that, you know, I try to stay away from like the x-rays and the CT scans just because I've been through so much radiation that that's just something I try to stay away from. Um, and then when I've had stones in the past, we've actually, my specialist and I have switched over to the low dose CT scans, um, which are actually better in terms of like the radio or the, um, frequency that your body's exposed to, but still being able to see the stones and really accurately see sizing and placements, which ultrasounds don't always show. Um, But as far as, I mean, during the pandemic, I think it's been a lot easier because there aren't as many people in the hospitals or in the centers where the imaging is done. Um, So it's been a lot easier to get in, uh, in and out really quickly. Um, And you're not, you know, you're not exposed really to anybody because there's nobody in the waiting room. Yeah, no, I think I think that's a great point. I think, you know, we we do think um, we spend a lot of time talking about telemedicine and how, you know, easy it is for telemedicine and how you don't have to go in and you can avoid going into a hospital and potentially avoid going into crowds. But there's also the flip side of it is that, you know, 
because of the pandemic, a lot of people don't want to go in. And so they're not getting some of the things done that they need to get done. And so when you do go in to get your imaging studies done, maybe there are less people there. Maybe it isn't as crowded. Um, but again, the important thing to note is that you still need to monitor your disease. Just because we're in the midst of a pandemic, your disease hasn't gone away. You know, it's still there. And, and I know you know it's still there, but it's, you know, even with all the additional stressors in your life that, that the pandemic has thrown at us, and, you know, whether that's someone being sick in your family, whether that's working from home, whether that's worrying about going into work, whether that's, again, the kids' home or whatever it may be, you know, you still need to put your disease first and foremost and take, take care of yourself and monitor your disease properly so you can really get on top of it, so you can reduce your stone burden or become stone-free like Lindsay is. So with that, I'm just going to give, you know, the closing remarks. The CDC does say to continue on your medications. Um, have at least a 30-day supply of your medications, and that way you can reduce trips to the pharmacy, um, as well as have medications on hand in case something do does happen. And don't delay getting care. So you, you have this rare disease, and this rare disease needs care. If you are passing a stone or you need to go to the emergency room, go to the emergency room. They have precautions in place to protect you from getting COVID-19 if you need to go. If you need to go into the office and telemedicine visits aren't working, again, they have precautions in place to help you and protect you from getting the disease. So you don't have to, you don't have to worry about that and you don't have to be scared to go in because of COVID-19. So with that, um, we're gonna conclude the presentation. Um, I'd love to get some questions from the audience. You can ask, you know, questions about COVID-19. You can ask questions um, to Lindsay and about her journey with the disease. Um, I did want to talk, I, I don't have any slides here, but I was going to mention, you know, quickly about vaccinations. Um, if vaccinations is something that, that you are interested in. Um, I, I have much more knowledge on the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine and Johnson and Johnson's a little is, is newer as we know, so I don't have as much information. But just for your own knowledge, there were groups in there um, that do have kidney disease. So it's the, the groups that were in the clinical trials weren't all healthy individuals. About 20% in each of the clinical trials um, did have some other comorbidity that would in, that some did include kidney disease. So there, there were some patients. Um, so you don't need to worry about that if you do want to get the vaccine. If you're thinking about getting the vaccine, you know, different states have different regulations right now, um, but you would fall into the comorbidity category. So if your state is offering um, patients that ha are um, immunocompromised or have some other conditions, uh, your physician should be willing to write you a note or whatever you need. Again, this is all varied state by state, um, so you can get into that group to get a vaccination if that's that's something that you're interested in doing. Lindsay, do you have any additional thoughts on, you know, living in the pandemic with a rare disease and, you know, any tips or tricks or things that keep you sane these days? Um, before we close out while we're waiting for some questions from the audience? Um, yeah, I think one thing, you know, obviously during the pandemic, I think we all went through like uncertainties and up and downs. Um, and I, you know, I think inside and outside of the pandemic, like I always say for myself, like, you know, you're the biggest advocate of your system area. Uh, it's like, you know, your body, you know, you know, what you're putting in your body and like the fluid intake that you need. Um, so just be very like aware of that. And, you know, the best that you can be to yourself, I feel like the better you'll be in the long run um, and the less stones you'll probably produce. That's at least my um, personal opinion and kind of the journey that I've been on. Um, so I think, you know, when things are bad, they're really bad as a scenario, but then when you're feeling good, they're really good. So just like take advantage of those moments and do things for yourself and just, you know, appreciate the things that you do get to do. Um, and then also give yourself grace if you have bad days or don't feel good or just want to stay in bed. Like, that's definitely somewhere that I've gotten to. No, and I, I think that's, that's beautiful and great advice. You know, you can't, you can't be perfect every day and you need 
to have days for yourself. You know, you can't get your fluid in every day or eat perfect every day. Um, but, you know, it's, it's important that during this day and age and with the pandemic that you still put your disease first and, and be the advocate that you need to be. Um, so we did have a question about that, you know, they're, you know, they're not, they're concerned that their urologist isn't very well versed in the disease. Um, so any suggestions on looking for experts in the area? Um, so one of the resources, I don't know if you are on the International Cisneria Facebook page, um, but they can help you find an expert in your area. Um, if you want to reach out through the hub as well, we can try and connect you um, and give you some suggestions for physicians in your area. But yeah, you know, so there's, there's different, there's urologists. So urologists can go on and do fellowship training. So anybody that's an endo urologist will be specializing in stone disease. Um, so like the physician that Lindsay sees, he's an endo urologist. So he has specialty training in it. So if you wanted to look on your own, um, try and look for a, a urologist that did their fellowship in endo urology. Um, and these are becoming more popular and a lot more uh, urologists are actually going that specialty route. So typically I would say that most cities have at least one, one year endo urologist. Um, just, just look a little bit um, out there. And like I said, I think the ICF Facebook page is a really, really great resource and they can help you and try and find a good urologist um, that maybe some other cystinurics are seeing in your area as well. Um, we have another question about forming, even though the patient is taking their medication, they're, they're forming stones. So one recommendation I would do is make sure that the, that the patient is doing a 24 hour urine collection because that's really the insight to what's going on. So you, you know the patient's forming stones, so why are they forming stones? You know, is there, is there, fluid, in, is there fluid intake decreased? Um, is there sodium going up? Um, is, the P, is there a problem with the pH? Um, those, are, those are things that we can need to look at. Um, also, you know, depending on the patient, there is the possibility that they might not be forming 100% cysteine stones. So you can also work with your physician to have another stone analysis done. So when you collect a stone or when the patient goes in to have surgery to have the, the stones removed, see if you can talk to your physician about doing a stone analysis um, because there are a certain portion of patients that will form like I said, a mixed stone type. Also, if your pH is too high, so I talked about, you know, you want to use an alkalizing agent to increase your pH, but if you increase your pH too much, then you could um, be at risk for forming a different stone type called calcium phosphate stones. So that's something, again, that you can look into. So I would really suggest um, to make sure that the patient is taking their medication as they should be make sure that they are increasing their fluid intake to what it needs to be in their urine out. But I, I would really suggest doing a 24 hour urine collection and doing a stone analysis in this case, just to get a better understanding on what's, what's truly going on and why those stones, stones are forming. So thank you everybody so much for taking part. And I wanna really give a, a big thank you and a big shout out to Lindsay for sharing her story and taking the time to talk to us today about her experience with cysteine stones and COVID-19 and, and what she does. Um, again, the next webinar will be April 22nd and we'll be talking about uh, new guidelines for managing your disease. Um, so again, thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your evening and afternoon with us. We really appreciate it. Um, and thank you all. Have a great rest of your day.